Welcome to today's Research America Alliance discussion. I'm Jenny LeRae, and I'd like to thank you for joining us on Zoom and also for your partnership in the Research America Alliance. If your organization is not a member, please uh, reach out to my colleague, Joel, our director of membership, whose email is in the chat, uh, and uh, he can share with you um, uh, information about the Alliance and all the great work that we do uh, with your help. So today we are joined by Dr. Elaine Larson, who is the Professor Emerita at the School of Nursing and Department of Epidemiology at Columbia University. And she's also a scholar in residence at the New York Academy of Medicine. Dr. Larson is here to discuss the challenge and the path back to a rock solid defense against drug resistant superbugs. Uh, the format of this discussion is a little different than our alliance discussions because we're really encouraging you to ask questions during Dr. Larson's presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll have some time for questions at the end, but uh, please type your questions into the Q&A box or the chat. And uh, Dr. Larson and I will, uh, will get to those during her presentation. Um, so Dr. Larson, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Elaine. Um, and uh, we really look forward to hearing where we are in this fight uh, against antimicrobial resistance. I know you've done a lot of traveling around the world. Um, what's the status of this issue in the U.S. and, 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 and globally? Because it is a global issue. Thank you so much for being with us today. Great. Thank you, Jenny. I'm going to share my slides now. And... Um... Just confirming that you can all see them, right? And I'll I'll uh, start the slideshow. Okay. We can see them. Yes. Good. All right. Great. All right. Okay. So um, this is what we're going to be talking about, and my goals for this talk is to have a conversation with you, first of all, about what is resistance and why does it matter? What's the current status of global resistance and what are the causes and the implications? And the most important part for me of this talk is what are we gonna do about it? Implications for individuals and the public, for healthcare systems and for government. So let me just start by showing you the numbers of microbes in the world compared to the numbers of humans. The point is that they far outweigh us. And so we better make friends with them. And they're all over. We can't really survive without oxygen. We can't survive in crushing pressure with no sun in the rocks, in ice. But there are microorganisms that people are culturing from all of these places. So the time uh, may come, said Alexander Fleming, when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there's a danger that the ignorant man may easily under dose himself and by expressing his, uh, by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities uh, of the drug, make them resistant. Now you may recall that Alexander Fleming was the person who discovered that penicillin, uh, he accidentally discovered it, that penicillin was a good anti antimicrobial agent and won the Nobel prize for that. He was right at the beginning, and this is a quote, uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, antimicrobial resistance is common, has developed against every class of antimicrobial drug, and appears to be spreading into new niches. In the U.S., for example, each year more than 2.8 million antimicrobial resistant infections occur in hospital patients, and more than 35,000 people die as a result. We did a study, uh, my colleagues and I, at Columbia a few, some years ago, a decade ago. We were interested in um, looking at the additional costs of resistance above uh, the same microorganism that's sensitive. First of all, let me just say that the estimated cost of uh, healthcare costs for antimicrobial resistance estimated by CDC is $4.6 billion a year. This is in this study, and you can see here the, um, the, the results. We looked at the same organism, a staphylococcus, that was either resistant to antibiotics or susceptible to antibiotics. 
and um, using a database of over a million patient charts, we looked at the additional charges for the resistant infection above the same staphylococcal infection that was sensitive. And what we found is if the patient acquires the infection in the hospital, there's an additional almost $19,000 in costs to have a resistant organism than the more susceptible. That's because of increased um, costs of antibiotics, et cetera, or treatment. The length of stay averaged on, uh, increased by an average of 2.2 days and the death rate increased by 4%. The community acquired staphylococcal infections were even more dramatic. The average extra charge for the resistant infection was $32,000. It added 4.2 days of hospital stay and uh, increased the death rate by about 3%. Outbreaks in the community are common primarily among groups that have close contact. And these are examples of outbreaks that have been reported in the literature. Among football teams, you may have remembered some of the big outbreaks that occur occurred in inmates in correctional facilities, military recruits, daycare attendees, Native American and Alaska Natives, men who have sex with men, tattoo recipients, hurricane evacuees, and long-term care residents. These are all um, studies from the literature in these groups. Uh, now, the, what they have in common is a common cause of frequent interchange and direct contact. But why are microbes uh, so able? Uh, what, what are the characteristics that make them develop res resistance quickly? First of all, they reproduce quickly. Every 20 minutes, bacterial populations can reproduce. Um, unlike humans, bacteria can exchange genetic material across species. So uh, humans can't usually exchange, uh, you know, procreate across species, but bacteria can. And under antibiotic pressure, resistant mutants emerge and take over, um, overgrow and take over. And that is What's the, what's the cause of antibiotic, increasing antibiotic resistance primarily. So what are, what are the effects of antibiotic prescribing on resistance? Here's a study uh, published in the British Medical Journal. It was an analysis of 24 studies in primary care. They found that the risk of resistance in respiratory and urinary tract infections was about two and a half times greater as the rate of antimicrobial resistance. This is antibiotics. So as you probably, as you know, antibiotics are talking about bacteria. I prefer to use for many things, the term antimicrobial that also includes resistance in fungi and other kinds of uh, microorganisms, not just bacteria. The effect uh, in these studies was greatest immediately in the month after treatment, but it often persisted up to 12 months in an individual. For example, if a patient uh, um, acquires an antibiotic resistant strain, this was in primary care, so outpatient, uh, it lasts, it doesn't go away right away, even with the antibiotic therapy stopping, it stays for up to 12 months. Antibiotics in agriculture um, is also uh, an issue. In 2020, there were more than 230 million pounds of antibiotics approved for use in food producing animals, many times more than the amount sold to humans who are sick. Many of the antibiotics used in agriculture are the same class as those used to treat human infections. So this just is a study, um, which was a modeling study that showed the uh, antibiotic um, consumption in animals in 2010. And based on the same um, rate of growth, the predicted antibiotic use in 2030. So you see that China has the most antibiotic use in the world um, in, in agriculture and the US is second. At the same time, the arsenal of antibiotics peaked in 2000 and is still declining. So this shows um, the number of antibact new, antibacterial new drug applications that were approved 
over time. So in the 80s, you can see there was a lot of activity in new drug applications for antibacterials. By 2012, it had been reduced to almost um, zero. And as of 20, these are uh, two, I mean 2020, these are the latest data I could find. Um, 23 antibiotics as of 2020 were in development, 15 in phase one clinical trials, 13 in phase two, 13 in phase three, two have had new drug applications submitted. And historically about 60% of drugs that enter phase three will ultimately be uh, approved. So you can see that the antibiotic pipeline is slowed down considerably since the eighties. So as a result, the development of new antibiotics will not solve this problem alone. We used to think for years, oh, well, this bug has become resistant to antibiotics. We'll just use a new antibiotic, but that isn't possible anymore. There are now drugs out there that are non-treatable by any known antibiotic, a new, new infections out there, uh, particularly internationally. So no new classes of antibiotics have been discovered since the 1980s. The antibiotics that are now uh, coming to market in the past three decades are variations of the drugs that have already been previously discovered. Discovering and develop new, developing new antibiotics is challenging because the research and development is pretty tricky. It's time consuming, it's very expensive, and it often fails. So generally it takes right now 10 to 15 years and over a billion dollars to develop a new antibiotic. This kind of tells you how amazing it was that we get developed a COVID vaccine in such a, uh, such a short time. And that was because huge amounts of resources, rightfully so, were put into that development. Um, not a, that's not the case for developing new antimicrobials. So developing uh, antibiotics to highly resistant bacterial infections is not likely to be common because few patients contract uh, these infections now and they meet, and few of them meet requirements to participate in traditional clinical trials. And there's little incentive, understandably, for industry to develop drugs because it's so costly and the cost benefit is not in their favor. So I wanna talk now, I wanna move quickly before we all get really depressed to what are the implications for individuals and the public, for healthcare institutions and systems and for the government. So first in terms of the public, this is another study that we uh, published uh, at Columbia uh, 20 years ago, but I will tell you that we've been following up and it's still the same. We interviewed over 2000 individuals in New York City. 88% of them thought that colds were caused by bacteria. Only uh, less than a third agreed that most colds or flu would improve without medication. And usually what they said is it needed to be an antibiotic. Uh, about 90% stated that antibiotics are usually or sometimes needed to treat viral throat infections. And almost a third stated that antibiotics were usually or sometimes indicated for asthma. This shows huge problems with understanding among the public uh, about antibiotics and the fact that they aren't, um, they don't work for, for viral infections, that the main treatment for viral infections is vaccination, the main prevention. So antibiotics sold without prescription. This is another study we did. Again, it was uh, almost two decades ago, but we have done the same thing recently and found it's still true. I found this unbelievable. I heard about this myself when I was down in DC and I heard a person give a talk. I was on a panel, uh, a, another panelist told, made a pronouncement that in New York City, you could get antibiotics without a prescription. I thought, no, I don't know. So we did a survey of three New York City neighborhoods what we found is that one in five of the stores in the Hispanic neighborhood, that's Washington Heights and in that area, had antibiotics prominent on their shelves for sale without a prescription. The antibiotics that were available uh, upon request, even if they weren't on the uh, shelf, 
included ampicillin, amoxicillin, tetracycline, and erythromycin. And the bodegas offered these in single doses for a quarter or in larger quantities, and you could mix or match. So this was an astounding surprise to us. And it, I'm sorry to say it's still occurring. For the public then, the main thing to prevent infections, viral infections, is to encourage vaccination. And right now the anti-vax um, lobby and concerns are very scary for those of us who are concerned about antimicrobial resistance in general, because people then get antibiotics for colds and flu, which we don't want. And then uh, clearly what we saw is a need for the public to be better informed about the appropriate use of antimicrobials and what they're good for and what they're not good for. So in terms of healthcare institutions and systems of healthcare, here a little bit more data. Outpatient U.S. antibiotic use. These are from data from CDC. 80 to 90% of human antibiotic use and more than 60% of antibiotic expenditures are in the outpatient setting, not in hospitals. In 2014, 20, I'm sorry, 266 million courses of antibiotics were dispensed to outpatients. That's the equivalent of more than five prescriptions per year. That's about one per year per person in the US. At least 28 to 50%, depending on the studies, of prescriptions in the outpatient uh, arena are unnecessary. Antibiotic prescribing in the outpatient setting varies by state and by health plan, which it really should not if people are equally likely across states to be needing antibiotics. Huge variation, which I'll show you a little more on in a minute. And local outpatient prescribing practices contribute to local resistance patterns. In terms of community prescribing patterns, the rates of prescribing antibiotics for viral upper respiratory infections range, depending on the study, from 25 to 56%. When presented with clinical scenarios of viral pharyngitis, 81% of almost 1,000 clinicians who order prescriptions used an inappropriate treatment strategy. 22% of emergency room visitors reported that their physician routinely prescribed antibiotics for a cold. And more than 800 physicians who were surveyed rating the issue of resistance as the lowest of seven predictors or denominator, determinants of their choice regarding antibiotic prescribing. This is uh, antibiotic prescribing per thousand population by state. This is outpatient prescribing. And you can see the variation that the prime, this is the largest, the darker red color, is, is uh, located more in the south. In the west, um, it's more conservative. So these variations by um, location don't really make sense because you can't, you can't assume that people have different needs for antibiotics across the country. Dr. This Lundin, is uh, a slide from C oh, sorry, Thank you very much. Great, yeah. that's perfect. So more than half of antibiotic prescribing for selected events, events in hospitals are not consistent with recommended prescribing uh, practices. Uh, based on CDC, you can see that antibiotic prescribing was not supported for a number of these various patients. And I will um, go a little bit faster, but you can get the slides. Uh, they'll be made available. It's a study we did in um, three pediatric intensive care units in New York, uh, the New York metropolitan area. And 38% of the babies in these units received more than one, one or more antibiotic that violated CDC recommendations. In long-term care facilities, 50 to 70%, and this is an article that was just published a few months ago, 50 to 70% of nursing home residents are prescribed at least one antibiotic every year. And 25 to 75% 75 of antibiotic prescribing in nursing homes is inappropriate. So in terms of healthcare systems, there's three strategies to reduce antimicrobial resistance, preventing the infection in the first place, antibiotic stewardship, 
and infection control when somebody gets an infection. And then uh, lastly, a few comments about the government's role. And of course, the external influences are CMS reimbursement, public reporting, legislation, and big business. Just here is a summary, and uh, when you get the slides, you can link up with these. These are the key U.S. actions to combat antimicrobial resistance in the last decade. But progress has been slow. For example, FDA uh, a decade ago did not approve two long pending petitions from consumers to limit the use of several antibiotics in farm animals. They said a voluntary approach would lead to more judicious use of the drugs in agriculture. But unfortunately, there are data now to show that a voluntary approach in veterinary medicine is not gonna work. Uh, the Presidential Advisory Council on Combatic combating antibiotic resistant bacteria, PACCARB, I sat on for um, uh, six years. And uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. It was established in 2015, focused on a One Health framework. It includes a number of experts from human and animal health, agriculture, and the environment. They have produced 11 national reports and national recommendations to the federal government. Um, and we published a paper, uh, myself and several other members of the PACCARB, analyzing pieces of antimicrobial legislation. Um, there were uh, four out of 20 of those pieces of legislation that were brought to um, uh, forward between 2011 and 19, 14% four, uh, passed. The common themes of those that passed were incentivizing new drug development, biodefense, expanded scope of use, stewardship, and stricter vet veterinary oversight. So we, we uh, in our conclusion, we uh, um, uh, concluded that the current balance between guidelines versus legislation does not seem to have adequately addressed the rise in antibiotic resistance. Striking the right balance will require more effective dialogue between policymakers, public health experts, and the agricultural industry. So will, will legislation work? Yes, in settings like the Netherlands and Denmark, where there have been strict policies, regulation about antibiotic stewardship, there is clear evidence that rates of resistant organisms have dropped precipitously. Uh, the US has been somewhat slower than Europe with re in regard to such legislation. So PACCARB's recommendations uh, are two uh, key actions, to maintain or increase funding for the CDC's uh, initiatives and to stress the importance of continued funding for research in agriculture. Just to show you uh, what the current grants and projects for antimicrobial resistance are, I looked at the, CD, the NIH reporter. So between the, um, you know, uh, 2013 and 15, there were only two antimicrobial projects that had antimicrobial uh, grants funded by NIH. Uh, until 1919, there were 10. And in the last three years, there's 39. So there's promise that we are increasing our funding. So what's needed for sustainable solutions? Clearly political will, ownership by the whole uh, stakeholder chain, including the public, healthcare systems and the government, specific to context because we see that things change by state. They need to be evidence-based. It needs to take into uh, consideration uh, country capacity because in some countries we don't have the same resources. Understanding how to change and impact people's behavior, cost-effective uh, strategies and spanning the One Health spect spectrum to include not just the healthcare community, but also agriculture and the public. And in summary, a quote from the New Yorker, which I love, we are an endlessly variable stew of essential microbes and they're working in ways we have not yet understood. Antibiotics are so mir miraculous that we have been lulled into a belief that there's no downside, but there is. They kill good bacteria along with the bad. So we must live with respect for the antimicrobe Probial world that we share. So I just want to thank you and give some credit to those who 
uh, loaned me some slides. So uh, we, we have time now for Q&A. Thank you, Elaine. What a comprehensive presentation. Uh, and we'll have the slides available uh, on our website. Uh, thank you so much. Um, a couple of questions came to mind, and then I think we have some from, um, from our audience as well. Um, a couple of years ago, um, Medicare required as a condition of participation that hospitals have uh, antimicrobial uh, stewardship programs. And I wondered um, what your sense is of the impact of those. I mean, you sort of paint a picture that we really aren't making much progress, even though we have made some policy steps, clearly not enough. Uh, but can you comment on the anti um, the AMR stewardship programs at the hospital level and and uh, how those could be better improved? Yeah. Um, first, let me say it's not just uh, Medicare. It's also um, the case that the Joint Commission mm -hmm. to be to be accredited has an, an requirements for antimicrobial stewardship pr programs that are pretty intensive and pretty tough to meet. And I would say that most hospitals don't yet meet all those criteria and they know it. And many of them, the good ones are working on it. There is just starting in the last two years, some evidence to show whether their impact. So the, the research that's been done and um, until the last couple of years has been primarily on how you get them to be implemented. Now we're seeing some studies to show impact. And it's really hard to show impact because we've, we've seen data to show that even after you do everything right, it takes a couple of years mm -hmm. sometimes to show any impact uh, on resistance reductions in, in resistance, but we're just starting to show it. I think it's still, we need, that's where we need some more research is what are the impacts of the stewardship programs and what are the components, the individual components of the stewardship programs that are most important. That's, that's kind of not an answer. No, it is. <laughs> it is. And that's, you know, we're very, um, I think of that as sort of in the healthcare delivery research arena, and that that research is is critically important as well. Um, the president's uh, advisory council, PACHARB, is actually meeting in two weeks. Um, what do you think will be their focus? Um, and I think this is the first meeting in, in some time. Yeah, I do have some slides on that. If we want to have a look at them, I could put them up. Well, do you want me to do that? Well, we or can, I'll just we can make those available to the audience. Yeah. Okay, great. We sure. Have questions, so I would let let's get to those questions first. Okay, sure. Well, let me just say that um, that PACARB um, actually has already published a number of reports with recommendations to Congress because they are actually um, their their task, their current mandate for that next infection. I mean, sorry, that next meeting in um, that's hap happening, the public hearing on the 22nd of February is their, their task to already to talk about how US government agencies can lead AMR efforts for sustained act action domestically and internationally. So this is the pa first PAC CARB public hearing that's gonna focus primarily on global problems and what the US can do. And their um, report from this public hearing is due to the uh, DHHS secretary by May of this year. So it's pretty fast. It's due to um, Secretary Becerra by, by May. So they're gonna focus this year right now on, um, on global. And that that's what, they think should be the priority right now because that's their task. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's terrific. I'm going to switch. I'm going to move to some audience questions and um, I'm going to combine one and then uh, Jacqueline um, will get on the screen and, and continue. Um, so let's talk about doctors and, and nurses, uh, in particular nurse practitioners. Um, are they learning in nursing school and med school about responsible antibiotic prescribing? Yeah, 
Um, we've done a couple of surveys about how much time is spent in the microbiology courses, for example, and in the clinical courses on exactly that antimicrobial stewardship. It's very little, very little. And both for, and for nurse practitioners who do prescribe and also for, uh, for clinicians, for physicians. And the data, there have been a couple of studies published over the last decade to show that, sadly, nurse practitioners who often take pride in the fact that they are careful, their prescribing of antibiotics is just the same as physicians. <laughs> so they're not, unfortunately, right now, the data do not show that they're any better. So we've got to, I, I think, for me, one of the top priorities in research is to now clinicians know and they will tell you that antimicrobial stewardship is really important and that it's really important for everybody else because they're doing fine. <laughs> so I do think that we need to have more research on really sort of the soft science of behavior change. Mm -hmm. And how do we motivate people to internalize what they need to do themselves? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a tricky kind of research. And it involves, you know, the social sciences in a way that we've never had to do before. Sure, but it's very important, absolutely. Oh yeah, So oh yeah. Uh, I'm gonna uh, ask Jacqueline to come on screen and help with some additional audience questions. Great. Thank you. Um, this has been a great discussion so far. Um, so for our first audience question in the chat here, here uh, there has been discussion of providers giving prescriptions in order to have satisfied patients. Could you address the role of freestanding urgent care providers in inappropriate, in inappropriate prescription of antimicrobials? Oh, I love that question. I'm so glad. Thank you, whoever asked that question, because it it's in everybody's mind, the clinicians, because in fact, it's it's the case that a patient comes, particularly if it's a parent, and they have to get back to work and their kid has a sinus infection or a bad ear and they're screaming and they're crying. And quite frankly, every one of us, every parent, even if we're clinicians, have been guilty of going to try to get a prescription to shorten the time so they can get back to work, right? But there is a there are a couple of wonderful studies, they're older studies that show that if a patient they want a prescription, but it doesn't have to be an antibiotic. So CDC actually has a prescription pad that, that you can give to patients that says, take um, you know, decongestants, give decongestants, give this and that non-antibiotic non things. Um, and um, if, if it's, and take antipyretics to get rid of the fever. In other words, it's a prescription for symptomatic care. And if you don't, if the child or you don't get better within 24 hours, call us back. And sometimes uh, clinicians even order an antibiotic and say, but don't take it for two days. Don't um, um, you know, fill the prescription until you've done this symptomatic thing because it's the symptoms that are that people want to get rid of. Okay. So there are ways to do that where you the clinician can still make the patient feel satisfied. And there are studies to show that patients do feel satisfied. If the problem is, I think some clinicians, because of the current economic things, they have so many patients, they can only spend 10 or 15 minutes per patient. And sometimes it's quite, it's quicker to just write a prescription for an antibiotic than it is to spend five minutes explaining to them about, about viral infections and so forth, but patients can take that kind of news and like it. Uh, and in the long run, it's gonna save time. Great. I'm sorry for the long answers. No, that's very appreciated. <laughs> so for our next question about diagnostics, uh, what role do diagnostics have in effective stewardship? How can current oh. diagnostics be improved? Oh. That, another great question. Thank you so much. That may be coming from a clinician or uh, somebody, but one of the reports from um, PACCARB specifically deals with that. And 
who I would I would recommend that this person have a look at that report and the recommendations. But clearly, diagnostics are really important, and there's you know there's emphasis on needing to culture somebody who has uh, an infection so that you treat it with a proper antibiotic. But still, sometimes, particularly in lesser developed or um, lesser uh, income countries, they don't have the money to do the diagnostics. So we've got to make rapid diagnostics because people can't wait for 24 or 48 hours to get treated if they've got strep throat. And it used to be that if you had strep throat, you give them penicillin and it would work. But now it doesn't necessarily. So we need those rapid diagnostics to make the right treatment available because that will really reduce antimicrobial resistance. So it's a huge area of research need. And I commend to you the report that's online free from PACARB about what, what could be done about that. We also, um, Elaine, have done a couple of panels on the role oh, good. of diagnostics and AMR um, over the last few years. So we can we can make that available as well. Terrific. Yeah, Terrific. really critical tool. I think we have yeah, thank you, for, um, at least one more question, Jacqueline. Yes, um, it's a good segue to question about COVID-19. So this, the pandemic is now almost four years old. Uh, what impact has the pandemic had on AMR, both in the US and around the world? Yeah, um, actually the research is just coming out on that. And there, there are some studies now. Um, CDC found that because during the pandemic, first of all, uh, they weren't able to collect data on nine of the antimicrobial uh, resistant organisms that they usually do. But the, veil, the available da data shows that there, were, there was an increase of at least 15% between 20, not from 2019 to 2021 in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the antimicrobial resistant organisms. So they've all increased. For example, uh, antifungal resistance to Candida auris, which is a huge new outbreak problem, increased by 60% resistance. Uh, another example, multi-drug resistant pseudomonas during that time period increased by 32%, et cetera. So COVID had a, a pretty devastating effect on rates of antimicrobial resistance. I think an indication that sometimes patients with COVID got super infections and super bugs. Um, so does that, does that answer the question? It does. But CDC yeah. has some really good data, specific data on all the different antimicrobial resistant organisms that are of primary concern now. Mm -hmm. on their website. Great, thank you. And uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, what do you think are the three calls to action based on this data and your own experience? Seems like the issue, this issue is under the radar screen. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's so funny because more people this year, this season already died from COVID as from flu. And we're all scared about flu, we're all scared about COVID, and yet antimicrobial resistance is the hidden epidemic. So I think uh, three things I would say, first of all, sort of the public campaigns so far to help the public be aware of this issue haven't been very effective. And that's not a research issue, it's a, it's a marketing issue. And uh, I think we need more marketing expertise about how to make sure that the public is is well aware that it's an issue, and also public about what what things they can do without taking antibiotics for viral infections. I think the second thing is what we talked about before, and that is we need better understanding about some of the social sciences that we can motivate clinicians to to change their behavior in terms of antibiotic prescribing, because they know, we all know in our heads that we shouldn't, but when patients come, we do it anyway, especially if it's um, you know ex expeditious or something. I would say that. And then um, when I asked the PACCARB uh, chair and staff person, what is your top priority? What do you think should be the top priority? They said, funding, funding, funding. 
but that isn't particularly helpful because we have NIH, as I showed you, is already doing more. But I think um, industry is also ha can play a really important role in helping to, um, you know, to lead to lead efforts to for antimicrobial appropriate stewardship. So I would say funding, particularly by not just government, but by other NGOs and by industry. Well, thank you, Elaine. Um, really, you know, as I said, we've done other programs on uh, antimicrobial resistance. I think yours, from the perspective of a researcher and someone who um, was on PACARB and, and helped to lead PACARB and has been doing this work for a long time, uh, it was really illuminating. Um, lots well, of okay. Do I have time to say something for one minute? One other thing? Go for it. Okay. I am also personally interested because I have uh, an immune defect and I have had over the last 14 years, multiple antibiotics to which I'm now resistant. Mm -hmm. And I have to try to treat um, with my hematologist, my sepsis episodes, which are fairly common without antibiotics whenever possible and make sure. So I am personally interested in this topic which occurred way after my professional interest. So I have a personal interest and I thank all of you uh, in industry, the researchers and the clinicians for the work that everybody's doing in this area. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you for sharing that. Um, my pleasure. Hear of that, and it does help to explain your, your uh, wonderful passion, passion for this <laughs> issue. Um, so uh, I'm gonna now turn it over to Jacqueline to uh, talk about what we have coming up next. And um, Jacqueline, over to you. Yes, thank you, Jenny. And thank you, Dr. Larson for, for this excellent discussion. I'm going to paste links in the chat now. Uh, before you go, we hope you can uh, join us for our next Alliance discussion on Monday, February 12th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll be featuring Dr. Abraham Vergese. He's a best-selling author, Linda R. Meyer and Joan F. Lane Provostial Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. So we've asked Dr. Vergese to discuss how his career in medicine and writing has helped his outlook on the art and, the art and science of human connection. He is the 2024 Advocacy Awardee for the Isidore Rosenfeld Award for Impact on Public Opinion. We'll be honoring him on March 13th, along with the other awardees at our annual advocacy awards. More info is in the chat. So thank you again for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great afternoon.